So yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Amber Boss, uh, for organizing us, getting our, our slides in order, uh, and helping us uh, test test this out. So hopefully, uh, our AV will be better than I think the first session uh, earlier this morning, where we had lot, lots of technical difficulties. Um, so, so today, uh, thanks for reading out the question mark. There's a, there's a, a bit of a, a hanging question uh, for, for this room, for myself. Um, as I'm trying to do some thinking around uh, my next book project, um, which I keep saying, uh, it's, it's been going on for like four years, but there was like a pandemic, and I'm now a department chair. Uh, but the, uh, the book is tentatively titled Slow Maps, Cartographic Attention, and the Question of Geography. And I'm, I'm attempting to meditate a bit on the map amidst our kind of constant and frenetic digital culture. Uh, and I'm attempting to try to understand a bit more uh, the idea of speed and cartography, not the drug, but the, the, the rhythms and the movements that are necessary uh, to kind of meet this kind of rapid pace of cartographic experimentation and development. I'm attempting to argue in the book that the new opportunity of cartographic practice is actually kind of a renewal of a pre-digital one, so a, a renewal of a pre-digital challenge in the field, which is how to produce an effective mode in map making, not limited to a singular or universally received map message. The book is attempting to develop a concept of something I'm calling cartographic attention, and in doing so is attending to a more, I think, pernicious question around what is the role of geography in contemporary life. So by examining some debates around the geographic education, the concept of geographic education in the United States in the early 20th century, especially as there's a growing interest in the use of hand-borne maps in the classroom, uh, I'm attempting to uh, try to understand the origins of what I consider an ambiguity in the discipline around how to support and innovate in the teaching of geography. So I'm setting this somewhat in the, the 1930s and 40s uh, in, in American uh, primary school classrooms. The book is also trying to tack back and forth then between those debates in this interwar period uh, and our kind of current uh, situation uh, around the urgency of cartographic attention uh, in our classrooms, um, and especially uh, with the rising kind of concern about what, what constitutes geographic knowledge uh, in the United States. This third, the third chapter of the book is titled Effective Modes, and it's attempting to conceptualize the effective dimensions of cartographic practice by attempting to renew this kind of critical cartographic sensibility, one that maintains that the role of map design should be to create environments, not necessarily to view environments, but to create them. Uh, beyond the kind of map use determinisms that are enforced by what I call a kind of neo-Robinsonian tradition. So in, in what remains today, I want to contemplate the distinction then between map effectiveness and affective maps, connecting with some of the geographic literature around affect and emotion without uh, digging too deeply into these debates. I want, to, I want to think carefully about what I consider these more than representational moments of a distinctly representational practice. Okay. So in the spring of 1949, the 16th International Geographical Congress was held in Lisbon, postponed from the previous September, the first such meeting since the Second World War. While the meeting notes only briefly mentioned those who had died and were otherwise unaccounted for, the sessions seemed a lively set of conversations around the advancement of geographic inquiry around the world. These congresses have met since 1871, and according to George Kish, they're the longest series of international meetings of any academic discipline. Papers at this congress in 1949 were organized in seven sections, methodology, historical geography and the history of geography, the geography of colonialism, human and economic geography, physical geography, biogeography, and a seventh section was devoted only to cartography with five key questions. The first, a concern with how to represent to relief topo topographically. They were highlighting approaches by the Swiss. Uh, a second set of questions on how to represent flat and wooded areas uh, using French Guyana as an example. A third question of this section concerned a resolution that all maps should use an international terminology to indicate their source material as well as uh, their reliability. While a fourth question concerned more generally the standardization of conventional signs. 
A fifth question of this cartographic section overviewed recent cartographic work and forwarded a proposal that a one to one million base map of the world would be developed for representing a wide variety of geographic uh, distributions, what would be commonly referred to as the international map of the world, and you can read more about this in Bill Rankin's book, uh, After the Map. So in what remains of my time, I want to highlight an individual participant in this 1949 meeting in Lisbon. And maybe to no surprise to many of you, uh, it's Erwin Royce, a professor of cartography at Harvard who I've written a bit about uh, in the book New Lines. So likely needing no introduction to this audience, Royce was well known for his map of the landforms of the United States. Created in the 1930s and undergoing edits until his death in 68, this map likely animated Royce's thoughts at this conference in Lisbon. Royce's technique might now be considered genre, all the more interesting given his commitments and instruction to produce cartographic representations that would neutralize the impacts of personal style muscular coordination and control, the comportment of a cartographer to pen to paper would strengthen the representational magic of cartographic generalization. Royce kept diaries, and yet these are available to read at the Harvard Map Collection. Captured in the pages are travel itineraries, notes toward his course planning and publications, as well as some fantastic illustrations in colored pencil and watercolor uh, here from his trip to Pigeon Rock in Lebanon. Royce actually documented his trip to the IGU in Lisbon in six pages of this journal in late March of 1949. His birthday was earlier on March 1st, and perhaps this explains the drawing of a birthday cake and a celebratory dancing cognac here in the middle, uh, where he spent his evening in New York City with a friend, uh, Helen and Lawrence, uh, on the Upper West Side, um, prior to his flight leaving LaGuardia on March 31st. Here on the far right, uh, kind of toward the bottom, you'll see that he's trying to capture a view from 19,000 feet as the sunset was passing over Nova Scotia. On the turn of the page, he writes, quote, not much sleep, documenting some turbulence with up and down arrows. His depiction of clouds perhaps through a stuttering of his pen to the paper. Further down the page, an early morning landing in Santa Maria Airport gave him a moment to capture a view. Flying over the Portuguese autonomous region of the Azores, Royce is clearly more awake. In, pen, in pencil and pen, he quickly sets down an oblique viewpoint of the east and west coasts of the volcanic island of Santa Maria, capturing aspects of human and physical activities, agricultural and marine practices near Via del Porto, with Pico Alto volcano tucked away into the clouds. In addition to the finer techniques of cartographic production, Royce was committed to field sketching. His earliest training in geologic sketching at Columbia undoubtedly gave him the analytical imagination to see landscape morphology and to do so through the process of sketching. His development of a kind of geostenography married the rhythm and speed of travel with the recording of visual observation. In other words, it would seem that the sketch provided a way of working out the geomorphology to capture in mere minutes a sense of geologic time. And this was of course happening as photography was quickly becoming the preferred method of collecting geographic information around the world. As much as this user submitted image available on Google Street View also gives us a clear representation of Via de Porto, it also lacks something. Its effectiveness as a technique within a cartographic platform I think obscures a more effectual moment in mapping. It's the interplay between these representational efforts, left and right, this century and the last, that helps me to answer or to think about questions and continuities between the representational and what Hayden Lorimer might call the more than representational. Perhaps at this most philosophical level, cartographic representation is a technique that exacts Descartes' theorization of a mind-body dualism, a metaphysical stance that holds that the mind and the body occupy distinct spatialities. This centuries-long impact of this theory enables a, a kind of repentant perspectivalism that leaves cartography vulnerable to the criticisms from Spinoza to Haraway and now to McKittrick that cartography is also a kind of disembodied practice. Amid the cataloging of, of effects within MapU study, what about the affect of map making? 
Sarah Ahmed provides a useful intervention for me here, writing in an essay called Effective Economies. Quote, the unconscious is hence not the unconscious of a subject, but the failure of presence, or the failure to be present, that constitutes the relationality of subjects and objects, a relationality that works through the circulation of signs. For Ahmed, emotions have this kind of rippling effect. They move sideways and backwards. They connect and stick between signs, objects, and subjects. They bring the past into the surface of the present. And while the object of her analysis in this essay is about hate speech, I think we might use this to think more about map representation. There are obviously moments of presence, of being present in the sketching of a map. Lines are set down to capture an imagined or real perspective, but there are other failures of presence, failures to be present that move, that, that the move to be cartographic ensures. The turbulence of perspective, I think, is smoothed away through our cartographic practice. This turbulence continues to beguile cartographic practice. And we periodically return to those methods of slow maps somewhat nostalgically, sometimes as a test of our patience and capabilities for attention, and in other moments to resuscitate an audience that has perhaps become too accustomed to the fast map. In his 1952 book, The Look of Maps, based on his dissertation at Ohio State, or the Ohio State, sorry, <laughs> Arthur Robinson understood aspects of these methods as, quote, essentially subjective. But I suspect he noted this more as a challenge to the practices of evaluation, that aspects of harmony, movement, balance, and proportion might continue to defy the exacting standards of a progressive scientific cartography. As digital techniques transformed cartographic practice at mid-century, this preference toward behavioral modes of experimentation and analysis crept into the drawing of a line. Draw a map, study the reading of the map, adjust the drawing, repeat. Map effectiveness has become this kind of tantalizing gloss. However, map makers continue to think and feel in other registers. We continue the experiment. We capture those emotions of the unconscious, the nudge that seems to force our pen to paper, that stirs us out of our mid-flight slumber to notice the world from our window seat. And so I perhaps conclude where I began, asking how do we study the effectivity of the map? And how is map effectiveness somehow mapping differently? And that's where I'm going to end. Thank you. Um, we'll be taking questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll be taking questions after each speaker um, and ask to the speakers to be able to just repeat the question or summarize any way in, into the microphone. Thanks. All right, questions? Answers? Anyone got answers? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I would say I'm about like 40% there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm basically, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in uh, something that I don't engage in much often, which is the, the practice of actually drawing maps by hand. Um, I, I do think that they, they provide a different way of looking at the world and, and uh, pausing in the world. Um, and I know that many of you, uh, in addition to doing all the incredible cartographic work you're doing on the computer, you're also doodling these fantastic illustrations and coming up with um, sketches and, and uh, procedural documents that help you uh, plan and draft out your cartographic productions. And I think those, those moments of pen to paper uh, that would have been uh, moments of fixation for early 20th century cartographers like Erwin Royce, uh, like uh, cartographers uh, in the classroom, like Edith Putnam Parker. These were moments that were incredibly important uh, to, the, to, the, to seeing the world uh, through, through the pen and paper. So it's something I'm, I'm interested in writing a bit more about. Yeah, sorry, who? That's the dancing cognac. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I, it took me some time to figure this out because this was, this was a, a birthday cake drawing. Uh, Erwin Royce, uh, this was a, sort of his initials. I, this says cognac. This is his friend uh, Helen in, in Manhattan. And no doubt a kind of like a fun birthday party happened the night before his flight to the IGU. Yeah, Clancy. Your mind, you have an idea of what things should look like, but your hand 
Mm -hmm. it making it appear that way. Um, so there's like a, a discrepancy between the image that you sort of might see there mm -hmm. and the practice that is required to actually turn it into an embodied kind of space. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how do you, because I mean, these are kind of remnants in a way, and I've always loved these archives, not the nice things, but the terrible things. The terrible things, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is about um, the way the body shows up in archival documents, perhaps, yeah, um, in all kinds of ways. Uh, not to the level, I mean, some of my friends who do archival work, they'll find scraps of paper that are um, unrelated to, to the archive. They'll find, um, I mean, when we were, Jeremy Crampton and I were working through the Brian Harley collection uh, at the British Library, we found um, McDonald's uh, you know, a, a, a kind of what is that, the, the delivery bag from a McDonald's kind of shoved into one of the archive papers. So there, there are ways in which, you know, a person announces themselves into the archive. There's a, a great piece by uh, Marika C4 um, and Trans uh, Quarterly uh, describing the finding of a piece of hair uh, in an archive um, and how that draws, uh, draws both uh, more of an understanding of the human that the archive is meant to document but it also draws us right into the moment of uh, connection with the, with the individual, um, and for me, that's that's the the effectual moment that that uh, Ahmed and others are trying to document, not so much as a as a kind of um, clever way of talking about uh, these other registers of human experience, but as a way to draw ourselves into uh, the research. Um, so in, in, in Erwin Royce's travel diaries, there are all kinds of these uh, documents, uh, documentations of his, his travels, uh, his, friend, his friend groups. Um, it's also a, an important way for him to organize his, his life. There's, a, there's an entire CV sometimes published periodically in the, in the travel diary as a way for him, to, for him to keep track of what he's done over his career. Um, with regard to uh, the kind of perspective of viewing, uh, for instance, at the, at the IGU meeting in, in, in 49, there was a great discussion apparently amongst cartographers of the day about uh, how easy it was for the Swiss cartographers to be able to document topography compared to the cartographers of French Guiana. Uh, the ability to sort of sit at a p particular perspective and view um, a relief uh, gave them in some ways a, a leg up uh, according to the, the notes from, the, from, from that meeting. Um, so there is, a, there is a way in which um, the opportunity of a disembodied eye through the form of aerial reconnaissance and satellite imagery uh, attempts to flatten some of the, the difference in uh, ability of access uh, that I think these, these travel diaries document a bit more um, the, the relative privilege of, of certain kinds of cartographic perspective.